It's good to be back with y'all. It's always good to preach. I enjoy it. I don't know about y'all, but I have a good time anyhow. But uh, I'm going to preach on a subject that you're well familiar with. I know you've read this in the Bible. It's called the preaching or the feeding of the 1500. How many of you read that one? It ain't in there. That's right. But it is. Amen. Turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew. We do appreciate all your prayers for us, and I just received a message from uh, one of our, the guys working in our radio station over there, and he said the fellow called him up from one of the, one of the villages out in there, and he'd been listening to uh, Pastor Robert preach, and said he just got saved and wondered what to do now. And so they're constantly having people saved through the radio ministry there and the different, uh, the different outreaches, so do be praying for them. Uh, one of our guys, he's been in our tri uh, Triennial Bible Institute. His name is Laban. Um, evidently, he was riding a motorcycle and a car ran over him and, and just really crushed his leg. They was going to amputate it, but uh, Lord's grace, they, they didn't, and I haven't heard back since. Uh, the outcome, but uh, he'd been working with one of our, our churches out in the village there, so if you'd pray for him, I know they'd really appreciate that. Um, really, I am going to preach on uh, the feeding of the 1500 this morning. Uh, if you'd stand and honor God's word, we'll begin reading in Matthew chapter 14 and verse number 13. Matthew chapter 14 and verse number 13. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. When the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he, had, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening... His disciples came to him saying, This is a desert place and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. May we pray this morning. Father, a story that is very familiar with us as Christians. We've read this and heard it preached uh, many times. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us this morning to really understand what you do and, and that you're still the God that is on the throne you still work in our day, our lives, just like you did back in the scriptures. And Lord, that somebody might, that might be discouraged and, and, and having difficulties, that it might encourage them to truly trust in thee. And Lord, those that are lost here this morning, Lord, I pray that you might help them to see that they can trust you and that they would put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for eternity. Lord, bless us now. Uh, help us in this time as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, I'm a long-winded preacher. And normally when I, when I preach over there, I mean, we don't get, we don't even start looking at the door until about 1230 quarter one. <laughs> uh, they like preaching. Amen. So I hope you brought your lunch. Uh, 
No, I'm going to, that's why I'm not saying anything about this cold weather because I'm trying to cut to the chase here and, and get into it. Uh, back in about the year 2000, uh, Sherry and I was up in Soroti, Uganda, and uh, had a good ministry going on there. Uh, built the church and, and the congregation. Uh, we was running about 200 when we turned that one over, uh, adults, and then had a whole parcel of kids, I'm telling you. Alicia had rounded up just bunches of them and uh, taught them out there under a, a shed and everything, a tarpaulin for a while, and, and uh, things were going well, but uh, some of the folks had, had they'd been through a drought, and so Richard, one of the guys that worked for me, he took care of the yard, and, and, and we worked together, and he translated for me, and, uh, and a lot of things like this. Um, one specific day, uh, we was going to go on out to his village, where he was from, and take some food out for his family. And obviously, we always try to take every opportunity to preach the gospel. So we did. We got the food. And we got, went out there. And uh, uh, sure enough, his family was there. And, and we had a good time. And we gave them the food. Very appreciative of the food. And then they, as their custom, they would go around and start gathering uh, all the people in the village and start getting folks together. And uh, they came and, and we met right outside of their home. I mean, their home's just a little old, old mud, mud shack there. So we're, we're standing out in what we would call a yard. Uh, they don't have yards there. But, uh, and I got to preach to them. And as I was preaching, the gospel, uh, you, you can tell when people are with you and when they're, when they're sleeping. And they were with you, but they just weren't quite getting a hold of some of the things that we were saying. And, you know, we were talking about how, you know, if you believe with your heart, God says if, if you believe with your heart, that leads to salvation, not just with your, your head. I'm saying, now, how in the world can I get this across uh, to where they're going to understand it? Um, we've got a rebel over there. Uh, he's still alive and kicking, but his name is Coney. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of Coney, but uh, he comes down. He, he'll raid a high school like he'd come into town here, and he'd raid uh, the high school and, and uh, kill the, the teachers, the staff members. And then they'd go ahead and get the boys and say, okay, you, you're going to fight for us. And if they said no, they'd blow them away. Uh, if not, then they would take them uh, as captives back to their, their headquarters out in the bush. And they would begin to indoctrinate them. They have the witch doctors. They get them doped up. They do all this kind of stuff. And they say, okay, you're going you're gonna to fight for, for me? And the uh, guy said, yes, because he didn't want to be killed. He said, all right, there's your brother. Kill him. And they have to shoot him. He gave them a gun with one bullet and said, you shoot him. So you got to either kill your brother or your friend or your classmate or whatever. And then they'll go ahead and they say, okay, now cook him or we're going to eat him. And they'll make him eat him. And they have messed up the minds of these kids so much. And after you've gone through all of that trauma, you have no idea of what the world is like out there. Uh, you know, we're pretty isolated here in Marshall. And, uh, you know, spit wads and, and chewing gum and stuff like that, under the, you know, that's, that's not the way the world works. And so I thought, you know, they understand Coney. And we'd heard that he was a little up north somewhere, uh, but... You know, I said, all right, now, when I talk about believing with all your heart, what, I, what I'm saying is that if someone comes running into the village right now and shouting and saying, Coney is coming, Coney is coming. Now, you can hear, every one of you would hear what they're saying. But if you just heard it with your mind, just heard what he was saying, 
in your head. You'd probably sit here and you'd start asking the guy questions. Well, you know now, what's this and how, you know, how many guys you got with you and all A, B, C, D, and you'd go down the line and you'd sit there. But I said, if you believed with your heart that Coney was coming in this, this village and is going to kill you, question time is over. You would jump up and you would run out the other side of this village as fast as you could. I said, that's the difference in believing with your head and believing with your heart. You go out there soul winning and this guy says, oh yeah, I, I believe I'm going to hell. Oh yeah, I, I, I know Jesus is the Savior. Uh, wouldn't you like to get saved? Oh yeah, I would, but I'll just wait. And they don't believe. They believe up here, but they don't believe here. And God says, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. And so I pleaded. I begged those people to come to Christ. And not one would receive Christ as their Savior. And so we, we finished it all up and, and we're trying to part as friends and things like that and, and left the food there for the family and all and, and we went back to town uh, in Soroti where we live. It's about 2 o'clock in the morning. All of a sudden, I mean a big old tank shot his round right behind the, the house and just shook, shook the whole house and definitely woke us up. And all of a sudden we're hearing automatic gunfire and just, just going back and forth and the shooting and carrying on and we, what in the world is going on? And we jumped up and first thing I thought was rebels. I told Sherry, I said, you put every stitch of clothes you can find on because we know what, how rebels operate, and I didn't want to make it any easier for them at all. So, so she did, and, and of course I got dressed, and, and uh, at that time I had a shotgun sitting over there, and I said, what in the world is this going to do me any good? I mean, they're out there with the big guns and stuff. And so we went into the, to the bed, or from the bedroom, we went into the, to the living room, and you can hear a couple bullets coming through the, the uh, yard, you know, and whizzing past, and, and, and if you run, where are you going to run? If we got in a vehicle and tried to take off out the, out the compound, the uh, military might think we're, you know, we're rebels and, and shoot us. And if the rebels see us in a vehicle, they'd probably think we're military and shoot us. So the only thing you can do is sit there. And so we sat there in the living room. For several hours, just looking at each other and and peeking out sometimes, and and just you know praying. What do you do? Can you trust the Lord if you know what rebels do? Uh, your mind really begins to race. And, and they, I couldn't tell you from the pulpit a lot of what they, they end up doing. But we finally, we, we said, well, sitting here and getting nothing done. <laughs> so we went and went back to the bedroom and just laid down on the bed and with our clothes on and everything, and we just stared at the ceiling <laughs> and just kept hearing all the shooting and carrying on. I had forgotten, just like we did the other night in the service with, with Skype, uh, talking to one of the missionaries, uh, uh, Dr. Chapel had arranged it previously that they were going to call us during their mission conference and do what we did the other night, just talk to the missionary and interview him and everything. And all of a sudden the phone rang, scared me to death. And uh, answered the phone, and Brother Chapel's on the other end. He says, uh, hey, how's it going? <laughs> uh, not so good. Uh, what's going on? 
and we begin to tell him. And he says, he told the story a while back. I, I heard him. He said uh, we could hear the bullets and shooting and stuff going on, and and uh, and so the, it changed the entire mission conference, to say the least. And Dr. Sisk, our director at that time, was there, and so he came up real quick and got on the on the thing. The whole congregation's here in the whole conversation, and. And we're, we're having prayer and all this. Uh, you definitely learn how to pray in things like that. And uh, so finally, they, they went ahead and let us, let us go. And, and, uh, and we just continued to lay there until the shooting finally calmed down. And, and we just kind of went to sleep. But uh, got up the next day and... Uh, went out driving around to kind of see and find out what was going on and what it was was Coney uh, and his rebels had hit the town and they'd started just right out behind pretty much right behind our, our house is where everything started off and they had hit that village that we had just preached at that day before um, we you know it, we had a Bible Institute. We pretty much had to cancel it because everybody was, we didn't have a family member probably in our church didn't have somebody killed. And so their minds weren't on, on Bible Institute and stuff like that. So we started going around driving to see what was going on. Thousands of people all along the roads coming in uh, just with anything they could have grabbed. Uh, and uh, they're coming in into town, uh, and and we're driving through all this, trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. Well, we got out to the church, and here is just a mass of people at our church, just sitting there, just looking at you, preacher. <laughs> we need help. Now, what are you going to do? And there's about fifteen hundred. People, there are thousands of them, even in the evenings, on the sidewalks of the street. I mean, it was like cordwood, people just sleeping on the, on the streets and, and, and things like this. If there's any opening of a building or anything, uh, they just flooded these places. And they said, help us. They don't cover this in Bible college. You know, they don't tell you what to do. We had a, uh, at that time, we have an envelope system. You know, Dave Ramsey is not the one that invented that. Missionaries did, I think. Because that funny money will, will get loose from you real quick if you don't compartmentalize it. So we had the envelope system and, and all of our bills. And of course, it's about the end of the month. And, and all that money was pretty much gone just a little extra here and there. And, and we said, well, what do we do? And uh, so we took all of that and uh, we thought we'd, we'd go ahead and try to feed them because, um, I mean, they didn't have nothing. Uh, Richard's sister and her family, they ran and they, they come, got in the church there and uh, they thought, well, maybe they've left and, and we can sneak back, you know, into the village and, and we can get, you know, try to pick up some food because nobody had nothing. And uh, they caught them and they killed her husband. They killed her 12-year-old boy and they beat her and their little, just several months old baby, senseless. They thought they was dead, and they just left them. And she came to several hours later, I guess, and and uh, and got the, got a hold of the baby and drug her, drug the baby out through the bush, and finally ended up finding a military man, and and he picked him up and and took him back to Embarada, and back to to the church where where we was at. And we took the baby to the, to the hospital, 
there and, and, and we paid for the care, took care of it for about a week before it died. Uh, Mama recovered and she stayed there at the, at the church. Life is pretty cruel in Africa. Uh, don't you complain to me about any of your hospital care. Don't complain to me about your government outside of if you want to knock the president, that's all right. But uh, you've got freedom that you cannot imagine. And in verse 14, it says, And Jesus went forth, and he saw the multitude, and was moved with compassion. He wasn't moved with sympathy. Sympathy is what some of y'all are feeling right now. You're feeling sorry for them. That gets zero accomplished. Zero. That's most of what we have in Congress and stuff like this. It's only, it's only facade. We're going to make a statement. That does a lot of good. You know, we're going to condemn their actions. They don't care. And that's not going to stop anything. But compassion, compassion forces action. We need some people that are compassionate. Amen. Jesus was moved with compassion. And he did something. He didn't just sit there and feel sorry for him. Notice in verse number 15, it says, When it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away. That's what they told us to do. Send them away. Well, the UN, they'll take care of them. And the UN was there. And they pulled in with their semis full of corn, full of grain, and everything. And they wouldn't give it to them. Full of grain. Full of food. And they wouldn't give them to them. Even one of our guys in our church was his profession. He was a miller. He had his own machines and everything. He said, I'll grind it for free. Just give it to us so we can distribute it. They wouldn't do it. The UN. Don't get me started. As worthless. And for weeks, those trucks sit there and they never give anybody anything. So what do you do? You got 1,500 people sitting on your front door saying, help me. So we emptied out all of our envelopes, which really wasn't much. And I went down to, to a place where they saw, sell bulk posho. Posho is corn flour, just ground up corn and in, in, in the fine powder. And, and then they mingle or mix it with, with water. And they'll either make a porridge, which is, you know, a little loose or or else they use less water and they make it a little harder and they'll grab it and eat it. And so I was able, with, with all we had, we went down there and we bought a half a sack, which is about 100 pounds, of post show. 100 pounds to feed 1,500 people. And honestly, I, I thought of this when I was driving back out to the church with that half a sack of post show. I said, what is it? What is this among so many? On the way, and, and the reason I'm preaching this message like this, I want you to learn to trust God. I loved that this morning, brother. That was good. On the way, driving back to feed, take that 100, 100 pounds of post show, I got a phone call 
from a church in California. Said, you know, we've just been praying for you and we just wanted you to know that we, we've sent, uh, sent some money uh, to the mission for you. Just didn't know if you had a need. Uh, just want to be a blessing. Oh, God. Yes, we have a need. <laughs> and yes, you are a blessing. And so after I dropped that off, I turned back around, went to the bank, got the money, and went back down, and we was able to, to, to start buying some post show. Uh, and then we started buying a few beans as well for the protein and everything. And that night we got, a, got an email from another church, and they said, you know, we just, you know, we took up this special offer and we just wanted to be a blessing to you. And, and it's probably in the mission already. And so, uh, yeah, amen. Just go out and buy vittles, they said. They didn't have no money. And our people didn't have no money. But God said, give them to eat. You may not think you have very much when it comes to missions, when it comes to tithing, when it comes to giving. Your little adds up in a big, big way. And God will direct it where he wants it to go when it needs to get there. He said, we only have here five loaves and two fishes in verse 17. What are they among so many? But in verse number 19, you see the key. In verse number 19, it says, And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, and he took. Who did? Jesus. And he took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke, and he gave the loaves to his disciples. That's exactly what he was doing. He was giving them loaves to me. Now, I had a job, and he said, the disciples to the multitudes. We talked about in Sunday school how God had, when we needed to start a radio station to reach the pygmies because the, they wouldn't let us they, near them anymore. They cut off our, our ability to get to them. And so the mayor of the city offered to allow us to start a radio station up there. And I, I mean, I didn't have no money. But a white man walks up and gives me $30,000, exactly what we needed for the station. It's, a, it's the same thing that's, that's happening here. When God is in it and he gives it to you, now you've got, and this is the reason, brother, I think God don't give it to us early because we'd misappropriate it. We'd take what God gave us and we'd use it for something else than what he intended it for. And that's why God waits until that specific time that we have that need and already he's been speaking to people's hearts about meeting that need exactly on time when he needs it. He blessed and he break and he gave it to the disciples. And then the disciples have the responsibility of giving it to them. For three months, uh, not one meal. When you, when you look at this passage in, in Matthew, Jesus supplied one meal for the 5,000. God supplied the meals, the food, for 1,500 people for three months. That's about 250,000 meals. My God is still on the throne. My God still supplies the need. When it's necessary, when it's the right time, 
And he uses God's people to meet that need. You, you say, well, nobody's presented us with a need. There may be a missionary out there that has a need and you have no idea, but he doesn't even know it until next month, but God wants you to give it now. So that when it's there, it's ready. We, we have a God that all we have to do, we don't see the end. We see the now. And the now isn't very exciting. Huh? When they took off a little bit ago, did y'all get excited? <laughs> or did you say, oh, let me see. Oh, i got to go. Oh. Okay, I'll give this one. Or do you think, hey, God has a purpose in all this. I don't know what it is. But God is going to meet that need exactly on time. Amen. We can still trust God. 250,000 meals. And we never got to send out a prayer letter asking people to give. <laughs> we, God just kept providing, kept providing. After about three months, the rebels came back in. And one night, they, our, our church, let's say our church is on this uh, excuse me, I'm looking this way. Our church, you wouldn't know either way, so I'll just put it over here. The church is on this side of the road as you're coming in through Kitchen Judgy. That's the, the village right there where our church is. And, and, and so you have this path that just kind of, not a road really, is kind of a path. On this side is the church. On this side is, is the village. And they come in down that road and they are burning all of these homes, all the, the, the village on this side, they never one time looked at the church. They had no idea that we had 1,500 people sitting in there sleeping. If one of them babies would have cried, we would have had a bloodbath right there in our church. I'm here to tell you, God can protect you. God can take care of you. I hear people say, well, you know, I talked to somebody the other day and they're like, well, I, I'm not going over there. They're snakes. <laughs> what you're saying is you don't have a very big God. What you're saying is God that you serve can't protect you. You need to look for another God. My God, he says, can supply all my needs. Not according to my riches, but according to his riches in Christ Jesus. My God can protect me. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't have got on the plane and go over to Uganda. Uh, you guys don't have a whole lot of AIDS here. We've got it all over the place. One of the ladies, she, she emailed Sherry this morning. Uh, works in our radio station. She's, she's got AIDS. Her mama died of it. She's got it. She's sick all the time. And, and going to the hospital and coming back and working for radio. Uh, you know, that's life over there. Any of you got malaria last week? If I was preaching in my church over there, many of the people are sitting there right there, have malaria, and they still try to come to services if their head's not blowing off too much. I've preached several times with malaria, and I'm telling you, that's not fun, but that's life. And we complain when it's four degrees. Glory to God. I'm allergic to cold weather. How big is your God? Do you really know God? And this, you said something this morning, brother, that I, I've preached and believed for so long. Most young people, they're going to die and go to hell because they've got their parents' God. Is not, he's not theirs. Every person in this building should ask themselves, is he really my God? When did I put my trust in him? When did I get saved? What has God, my God, done for me? Putting that rock down there. 
What, when has he done anything in your life? God can't, you know, I, I just suffer from all this smoke and everything. God can, can change that. Well, I just have to have that drink. God can change that. He says it all over. Well, I'm going to have to get a divorce. No, you don't. You can fix it through God's help. If God can feed 1,500 people for three months, and he can feed 5,000 for one meal in the book, I reckon he can take care of me and my little old problem. Problem is, I'm not as close to God as I, as I want people to think I am. Are you saved? Or are you just being religious? For 26 years, I was raised in my, in my parents' home, and I had their God. But he wasn't my God. Oh, I was confirmed. I was baptized. I was everything. I was the bell ringer. I was the, the you name it. I was the president of Fellowship of Christian Athletes in our school. I was the president of our youth group in our church. And I wouldn't have known God if he had walked in and introduced himself. It was my, my parents' God. That's how I was raised. But when did you come to the point in your life that you realized, I am lost. I am going to hell because I am a filthy sinner. And you get on your face before God, no conditions, no questions, no nothing. God, forgive me. Have mercy on my soul. Save my wicked soul. And put your faith and trust in him. Okay. When you find the God of this book, he'll do things in your life. He'll change you. And when you come and face situations and problems, and, and we all face them, you're going to say, I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm kind of excited to find out what, how you're going to do this. Uh, it doesn't make the problems any easier. But you know that you've got a God that's not going to make a mistake. And he can take care of you. He can still provide for you. He can still protect you. He, he knows what he's doing. And I don't. But I'm just going to Step back and trust him. Hey. Can you trust God? You see, a lot of people, well, oh, I wish I had stories like this. You're going to have to start walking with him. You're going to have to step out on faith. Brother Bill and I was talking. You, hey, it's scary going over to one of them countries. I mean, not just on a visit. I mean to live. <laughs> But you have to step out on faith. And even though you're scared half to death, you say, God, I'm just going to trust you and I'm going to do it. Amen. Maybe God's calling somebody to be a missionary. Step out on faith. Maybe you've got something that God's been laying on your heart, a ministry or something right here in this church. And you say, boy, I just don't know if I can. Step out on faith. Trust him. And you'll look back one day and say, wow, look at here what God has done. 1,500 people for three months, and we didn't lose one. It come to that point after that that the UN or, and all of the military and the government and everything, they, they started getting involved and they came in and said, well, it's too dangerous where you're at here, and they loaded them all up in trucks and carted them off to one of those uh, refugee centers. From that day, God never sent us another dime. 
You see, God knows when to start it, and God knows when to stop it. God knows when you need it, and he knows when you don't need it. And don't complain when he cuts off the, top, the, the spigot. Because that means you just want it for yourself and not, not for them. I'm here to tell you this morning, you can trust God. If you got this, this God, the God of the Bible. He can do great things through any one of you. If you will just avail yourself to him. If you're here this morning and you're lost. It's not his fault. He wants to save you. He's made it so simple and so easy. All you've got to do is agree with God. I am a sinner and be sorry for your sin and say, oh God, save me. I know Jesus died on that cross to save me from my sins. He said, I'll save you. I'll give you eternal life. If you die and go to hell, it's not because of God want, God's wants you to get saved. It's because you rejected the goodness of God. Whose God do you serve? Whose God do you have? Is it the God of this book that can feed 1,500 people for three months every day, every day, every day? We got pictures of Sherry standing out there and big old bags of post show and the people are around and the kids and everybody and I wish you could have been there. It has scared you to death. But I wouldn't trade it for nothing. Because God proved himself to us over and over and over and over. And that's why when God says leave the field and go teach, I, yes, sir. I have no idea what you're doing and why, but I'm just going to do what you say. Okay. And I know he can work it out. I, I tell you, I love my house out there. It's always been kind of a dream, you know. I know some of you put a lot of work into it. I didn't want to sell my house. I told him out there, I'm not selling it. And God said, I want you to sell it. Now I come to the point and I say, okay, God, I know you take things away from people, but I know you got something good for me. So it don't make any difference what I get. That's all up to him. But there is nothing more valuable than that personal relationship and that walk with the Savior. Because I know he don't make mistakes. And he don't make mistakes in your life either. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I don't know where you're at. I don't know your address. I don't know your problem. But I know most folks have got about the same situations. Some of you sitting here are probably lost as can be. Oh, you may be a church member. That's fine. That won't get you to heaven. Oh, you made a, made a pretense of, of, you know, I, I have the words down, born again and stuff like that. But you know you're not saved. God wants to save you. He wants to give you eternal life. And he wants to give you that life more abundantly but he's not going to force you. It's your choice to come and receive him as your Savior. And know for sure that if you die today, you'd be, you'd be in heaven. Christians, God wants to give you so much in your life. He wants to protect you. He wants to provide for you. You can trust him. I'm telling you, you can trust him. It's the same God as back in the Bible when Isaac and Jacob and, and, and Moses and David and Elijah. He's the same God working today and doing the same thing. If we'll just trust him, he'll work through us. Would you trust him this morning?
You may have been struggling. Some of you haven't been at this altar for months and months and months and months because you got a hold on it. You think you can handle it. As Christians, you ought to come and just dedicate your life back to him and say, oh God, I haven't been trusting you. But I want to start now. Some of you need to come and take the preacher by the hand and say, preacher, I, I've been struggling with this. I'm not saved. And I really need to be. I want today to be the day that I trust Christ and know that I'm going to heaven. It's all up to you. It's your choice. God's already made his choice. And he showed us in the Bible and even in testimonies what he does and, and even today. And he wants to do in your life as well. But the choice is yours. I'm going to have pastor come. And he can continue the invitation as God leads him. But as for me, I know I can trust him. Even though I don't understand everything. But I can trust him. What God do you have?